So we're live streaming for this training. Okay. Was well, a request from the fans. Right, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Good to go. All right, thank you. And I hope you acknowledge your papers. Welcome, everyone, to the uh, the final audit and risk meeting for this training. Um, we shall start with the council prayer. <laughs> Almighty God, as members of the Rangitake District Council, we give thanks for all the good things of our district and the advantages we enjoy. We pray that you will give us wisdom and guidance as we conduct the affairs of this meeting. We pray for all the communities and the district we represent. Help us to be fair and honest in our discussions and help us to work together in unity for the welfare of all your people. Amen. So, Ash, we have the apology from Nigel, and let's please note an apology from Angus as well. Okay, I think Nigel is apology for lateness. He is, correct. Apology for lateness, not apology for me. Correct, thank you. Completely right. Um, expectation that he thought he would be here around 10 ish. Yes, correct, yep. Suggested. Happy to both. Thank you. Moved to any seconded. Dave, thank you. Assuming that neither of you are going to vote against that, there's no point in saying. <coughs> All right. Um, moving on. Public forum. I understand that we are in the public forum. Are there any conflicts of interest? None, None to feature today. today. No. And... Confirmation of order of business, no changes not at all. So, moving on to minutes. The previous meeting. Any comments? I have one change to suggest, but I'm happy to hear if there was anything, Andy or David, you had picked up. Not from, not from me, Chair. <laughs> no, but it sounds like a test that you've found something. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not a test at all. No, no, it's actually an interpretation, and it's it's the way that something is written that I think doesn't entirely. Morning, Angus. Morning, Chair. Uh, so it's it's really purely about the wording of something, which is fine, but I suspect doesn't entirely represent the reality, which is under 9.3. Um, second para, in response to a query about what constitutes fraud, Mr. Toombs advised that it is part of his role as council fraud officer to be the judge of this. And I suspect that that's not entirely the case. My recollection is that's not at all what they had to say. Uh, and so the wording should be changed to reflect that guidance is provided in a policy as to what constitutes fraud and that there are two officers, the Chief Executive and Mr Toombs, who are the first point of contact in terms of establishing fraud. I've summarised uh, the comments that you sent in an email and the resolution of the with that. Um, I just think that um, allowing um, Dave to be the sole arbiter of what constitutes fraud is not actually a responsibility he would choose to shoulder. So it's minor change but to reflect the reality. Are you, Andy and Dave comfortable with that? Yes also, also to note that we unless I'm mistaken we recently reviewed our fraud policy within council and, and updated that. So the, I guess the, the council's Ooh. internal forward policies is the first port of call to uh, to establish a process following from that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, in that case, that's, if that's the only modification, um, the recommendation and the amendment is there. I'm seeing I propose that I should move that. 
Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. No. Call all in favour. No. Sorry, Angus, I hadn't actually gone to you for a comment. My apologies. No, no, that's fine. Just sort of snuck in and quietly sat there. Sorry, just in that case, you, anything further on the minutes from your perspective? No. Yes, thank you. Follow up actions. These are mostly closed or in progress. Um, and, um, officers are happy to take any questions if there's anything further. Andy. Uh, item number four, Mr Gartner. I was struggling when I read this to remember which Mr Gartner is referring to. Certainly, um, absolutely. Gardner is an international. The Gardner or Gartner? Gartner. Right. It is Gardner. It is spelled correctly, and it is an international organisation that is regarded as the peak body for advice and guidance, particularly in the IT and technology sector. Uh, and they had produced what on the surface looked to be quite a useful um, dynamic risk management model. Uh, but Dave and I um, conferred on that and we agree that it was um, frankly largely self-serving and very technology orientated. <coughs> useful in that space, but not a great deal of use beyond. And there might be some elements of it that would be useful for us to consider. Sorry, the only reason I picked it up is because I deal with somebody of exactly the same name and spelling. Right. And I thought it was highly unlikely to be him. Thank you. No, no, no problem whatsoever. It's, uh, and I'm sorry, I should have provided an explanation about that when I made the note for the action. Any other questions on follow-up actions. Um, the next one down, number five, um, you know, we're at an interesting stage there um, with the Environment Court sitting, so it will be appropriate that post that Environment Court sitting and decision that um, we get those bodies together. Do you have a sense, I don't, I don't know quite how the Environment Court operates, in terms of a decision, do they issue either an indicative decision or is it usually lengthy before a decision comes out? Well, that sits with the, with the judge. Sometimes a judge will issue an indicative position, I suspect. Um, here's they have 20 days. So we may just end up rolling out to that, 20 working days. Just the indication from Peter this morning that there are many items on the list um, that he's got to pre prepare evidence slash defence for. Could well be that just given the sheer amount of information, the judge will take some time to quietly work through everything. Oh, I suspect there's quite a possibility that he may rule some out of scope. So you know, what could be a very long list sometimes in these sorts of hearings, it's shortened. I don't know all the details, obviously. I'm separate to that process, but wouldn't surprise me. Absolutely. Angus. Um, through you, Chair, Your Worship, what did you mean in your first comment when you said the judge may well get them together? No, no, no. not the judge. We, the comment on number five was yes. we need the boards to get together, it's not the oh. judge, it's, it's our internal processes. That's all right, yeah, I was just wondering if there was something else, I was sort of looking at it, thinking, yeah, all right, okay. thank you. Entirely appropriate comment. Question, thank you. Anything further? Not for me. Nope. Angus, nothing? No. Nope. In that well, case? Yeah. Can you move the receipt, please? Happy to move. 
Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Angus. Thank you, seconded. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Um, I don't have a formal chair's report. I will just comment on uh, an initiative that I've mentioned earlier around Aon leading a <coughs> program of work to try and identify what are the common issues amongst audit and risk committees in local government and to try and facilitate some work to, to establish <coughs> what contribution could be made out of that group. Well, there's a, five of us have had a couple of meetings along with some Aon folk and um, I would be the least experienced of the <coughs> chairs, the very good group of individuals there, um, quite carefully hand selected. Um, in essence, what we've agreed is that the primary focus for the group should be in one sharing, and I won't say best practice, but good practice amongst the order and risk committees, and part of that might actually be inviting. Uh, competent chairs from audit and risk to sit in and comment on our meetings to share some thinking um, and professional development for chairs and committee members and I think that was something that I've been uh, trying to be a bit of a champion for and partly Dave that's a reflection back from the comments that you've made when I've sent out some information you've said oh that's interesting it's like Actually, that's caused me to think we do little in terms of development for the members of the committee. And if we can do something that isn't intrusive, expensive, time consuming, but helps lift skill sets in this area, and particularly, I think, in risk, then um, that there's some value. So that's the broad thrust. I would expect that by um, early next year, those that are involved in local government board and risk will see some you know, results of that starting to flow out. To some extent, it, it's replicating what might have been seen as part of the agency uh, that was proposed and is still sort of sitting in abeyance. So we have down that path. If, if that agency gets um, invigorated at some stage, you know, there's no preciousness, we would happily integrate the activities back into it. <coughs> so I think um, from what I can see already a good initiative being developed and there hopefully will be some valuable work come out of it. I certainly am seeing stuff being prepared that's of value for me uh, as well. So just a comment, nothing to Made you just acknowledging your your email to us with some intersessional um, notes from a meeting that you'd had, which was um, again uh, it was well received, and it was good to see that that came through. It, it was um, it was less filtered than what was presented at the local government yeah. uh, conference, and hence uh, thinking that it was best dealt with yes via that channel. All right, moving on to reports for decision and straight into protective disclosures update. I'll second your verbal report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I wasn't sure that it needed to or not. I'm yeah. more than happy to accept that <laughs> correction to process. Thank you. Gratefully received. So all in favour of the verbal report? Aye. 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 Against carried. Thank you. Protected disclosures. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'll take the report as read. Um, there have been no protected disclosures reported for this period. Um, I'll just note the summary. Um, so the Protected Disclosures Act 2022 replaces the Protected Disclosures Act 2000 and its amendments. Um, the policy or the RDC's protected disclosures policy and procedure was due for review by September 2022 in accordance with the Order and Risk Committee Work Program. 
the review was actually undertaken early in light of the new act being released. Um, the revised protected disclosures policy and procedures attached to this report and feedback from the Audit and Risk Committee is invited. Andy. The only one that, when I read this, the only one that ran through my mind was, is there a requirement that major companies that are engaging with us have one also? For instance, if we had, and I'm not picking on a particular company here, but for instance, say we had Higgins, which do an incredible amount of work, um, and they have things within their organisation that happen that affect up, flow on and affect us. Because it, the report does mention outside contractors somewhere within it. I can't give you the, the page reference off the top of my head, yeah. but... Were there any thoughts around that? The Act does allow contractors to make protected disclosures through to us, but I, I'm not clear on the legislation as to whether what legal requirements there are there, but it, it does allow them to disclose to us. Yeah. But there's no requirement on that, from us that they should have one. I would have thought that the legal requirement is that every company has one. Under the, yes, under the Act, I think that would be right. I'm trying to think of this. What, what scenario or risk are you trying to mitigate? Did you, did you have a specific uh, scenario um, in mind? For instance, uh, uh, there was very poor performance. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm, so again, I'm not picking on Higgins at all, but for instance, if they are a major contractor to us, and for instance, if they were doing some work that they thought will take it out of maintenance and will put it into emergency works, for example, at a different, different rate to their contracts, uh, that would be one potential opportunity. I'm probably getting myself in deep water here. <laughs> yeah, and Arno is probably ready to shake his head and say, back off him. Angus. Well, I, I think um, what His Worship is raising is quite relevant, um, but I would have thought it might be more in the, in the, in the field of um, having someone from a contracting company that contracts to us blowing the whistle on internal process and, and corner cutting or something of that, of that nature. Um, you know, around ethics and saying, oh, you know, they haven't put all the steel into the bridge that they've told us they had done and that someone signed off on. You know, um, that deal of, that level of, um, I, sp I suppose you'd call it, you know, it's, it's corrupt practice or it's, or it's just um, shonky practice. You know, it's, it's, it's having someone from outside blowing the whistle to us and saying, hey, this is not... This is not where we are. This is not what I stand for or what our company should be standing for. But if that's in, in the system already, um, in some shape or form, then fine. And we don't, and the policy in the Act does cover for that. So I think yeah. that, that is covered. It's the reverse, I think, almost that Andy's suggesting. One of the, uh, just sort of thinking about it as we're discussing it, it's, it probably is still a problem. I'm thinking through a scenario where someone spots something, yeah. not not a council employee corner cutting, but a, a contractor, subcontractor corner cutting. Rather than make the protective disclosure to that subcontractor or contractor, I think it's probably more appropriate and is allowed for in the policy that it would flow up through this organisation through the council, and it would come to, I don't know, Peter, to then, <coughs> to then address. And that's probably the more appropriate channel, I think. I'm trying to think through the different scenarios that could play out. So, Chair, are you suggesting that an external employee of another company might be able to report directly to Peter or Arno or whoever the person is? Well, they could certainly make a protected disclosure to the nominated parties. Right which would then involve, I don't know, if it was in that contracting space, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm getting this wrong. I assume you're getting it correct. I'm not 
hundred percent sure. There is, Chair, there is a section under there that says who can make a disclosure, and I think it does cover mm. those um, those fields. Uh, employee, secondary, engaged as a contractor or contracted, volunteer, governing body members. Yeah. So that there's uh, it's fairly broad in that respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I may just make a comment, I suppose the question really is, is it well communicated and, and do they know how to do that or how to get access to that? It's probably something as part of the PMO that we can do better to remind contractors that uh, there is this facility that if you see something that you don't like, that you can use this and bring it to our attention. Interesting, and just on that, you raise a good point, which is um, a scenario I'm working through where we're using a QC to do an investigation into an incident in a training company. Her early observation is that the policies are in place, but not well communicated to staff, and even when communicated to staff are very legalistic in their wording and very difficult to understand. And this is a group of people in the apprenticeship, you know, 20 to 30s age bracket, not familiar with that type of documentation or language. And ticks the boxes in terms of presence, but frankly, is unworkable. Yeah. You, know, you know, I think that element of the workability is, is really important. We worked hard to make the, our policies really easy to understand at all levels. I, I, and look, I don't think. Yeah, I think that works. This policy reads well. One question that has occurred to me when reading this through, and I then also went back and looked at the legislation and the guidelines from the Public um, Service Commission. Nowhere does it actually say, um, this is what you have to do. It talks about content. But how do you flag that someone has actually made a protected disclosure in the scenario? Now that they've opened it up to verbal as well as written, the, it, the scenario where someone says, hold on a second, I walked past Sharon and said to her I was concerned about so-and-so, and I made a protected disclosure, <coughs> and you've done nothing about it. So is it where, you know, how do you determine whether someone has actually made a protected disclosure or not. And there's no, there's no guidance for that. Um, I've raised that earlier, and I, I, I think your response, if you could please repeat that for the committee, is valuable. Um, so it's ensuring clarification from the person making the disclosure that they, they confirm that they're definitely making a protected disclosure. We'll go through that. Um, the flowchart as well, with them as well, to ensure that the steps are taken. So at any point, they can flag or confirm that yes, definitely. Yeah, has been made. Thank you, Angus. So, Chair, on page uh, twenty-four of the order paper, it's page five of the disclosure. It's got the first bullet point. You know what will happen after, uh, and it's about twenty working days. You know, Acknowledge receipt, consider blah blah blah. Is for the question that was just asked, is that where that is covered? But do you want a receipt quicker than 20 days? Because 20 days is sort of the standard legal yeah. boundary position, if you like. We'll, we'll endeavor to act within the 20 days, yeah. and I think we'll, we'll try and extend it <laughs> to that. But, you know, if, 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 say, I came along to Sharon and said, look, I've got something I want to tell you, would the receipt come back quicker than that? I mean, is, I is, so. is her first thing saying, oh, actually, are you making a formal complaint or whatever? And so you sit down. I mean, do we need that part of the process to be shortened up? I mean, if this is some life-threatening incident, you don't want to hang around for 20 days talking about whether or not you're confirming that. Correct. You're yeah. saying what you're saying. I mean, I within our organisation, if someone comes to us, um, myself or Sharon, with a concern, we make that a priority to sit down with them at the time and talk through their options. So if it, we would obviously try and get the understanding of whether it is a Protected Disclosures Act as soon as possible and work from there. It's not something we would sit back and go, oh, we've got 20 working days yeah, to yeah, yeah. get no, onto this. No, it's fine. Thank you. 
could that be more explicit in I'm assuming that you know, th this is our stuff, so should it be more explicit, those sort of something along those lines, or do we just leave it alone? I think the guidance is from the legal legal aspect, so if something does tip over, it does give us additional time if we need to do okay. more investigations. Yeah. I'm comfortable with that too. A couple of quest or questions, sorry, one, one further comment and just a suggested word and change and this was top of page 23 which is titled retaliation and this is in essence saying once protected disclosure was received the organisation cannot retaliate it seemed to me a reasonably high bar when I went to the guidance and I, my suggestion is just to adopt the wording that's actually in the public service guideline that says obligation not to retaliate or treat less favorably mm. and I, th I think that or treat less favorably it's sort of retaliate seems to be quite a high bar mm. you know, i've got to do something against <coughs> cal you know just really annoy me so I've, you know done something it's a significant <laughs> step Whereas the or treat less favourably seems to me to just sort of drop that bar down a bit and say, actually, no, I've just got to be really cautious. So that would, I thought that was a more appropriate wording and even softens the word retaliate out mm. a bit as well. So that's, that's a suggestion. Happy to pass that back for consideration by yeah, I agree. staff. And if I can make a comment about um, not not making a false declaration or uh, operating inappropriately, just to provide you know, a concrete example, organisation in the last couple of years that I've been working with, um, a senior staff member decided that he wasn't happy with various actions of the board and proceeded to write to shareholders of the organisation saying I'm invoking the Protective Disclosures Act and telling you this under that guidance. Um, yes, the lawyers had a field day and it actually cost that individual $80,000 in terms of damages in court. So the other side to it is important to point out to staff, if you're making a disclosure, that's fine, but be careful about how you handle it because the consequences of doing it poorly uh, can be substantial. I'll just through you, Chair, I'm just wondering uh, who the disclosure is likely to be made to in the first instance because my bet, if there was an employee, it would need to be probably at a reasonably senior level. My guess is that they would ask for a meeting with myself or their MP, rather than going to their, even the chief executive. So first level is actually at my level, Sharon's level. But in, I'm talking in, in, in the likelihood of a first approach, I suspect probably is not to start. Well, I don't know. I, yeah, we, I feel that Sharon and I have a, a relationship throughout the organisation that we do get a lot of people coming to us. And while we've never had a protected disclosure, we do have a really clear line of communication and people do feel comfortable coming to us to talk about any issues or perceived issues that they may have. Uh, if, if I, sorry, if yes. I, may, I, I completely agree. I think eternally there's no doubt in my mind that that's appropriate. I think uh, he was worship might be thinking of external approaches from other people, especially at a really high level. Uh, but I wonder if the correct response wouldn't be to listen and then divert them to the correct procedure to say we have something in place and we need to take it through uh, the group manager uh, as an official way to capture it. Absolutely, and I was going to head down the same path yeah. to say, all right, I've heard that, 
the guidance is Here's the process. talk to Sharon Christen. Mm -hmm. But if, unless there is a particular reason why, why not? that might not be appropriate under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. In which case, I think the, the discretion in the Act allows for others to actually be the receiver of the protected disclosure. So we've got you listed here. So disclosure to appropriate authorities. So if they don't feel it's appropriate to come internally, near chairperson of audit risk committee, commissioner of police, controller of audit general. So there's a number of options available to people. Yeah, I may just suggest policy itself is um, robust enough and, and you've indicated a, a word changing or a softening of one of those words in, in your earlier comments if we are here to consider the policy that is in place for the organisation then that should always be our first call mm -hmm. um, no matter where that ad ad advice comes from is to, to follow the procedures and that's why we have procedures and policies etc in, in place to do but one of the things that you were just mentioning is about a verbal comment is now included. Um, there is a skill set that is required to determine whether or not that verbal comment is in fact a, a, a protective disclosure. Now it may not come in, in, in respect of your relationship with so someone. It may not come to you, but it may come to a um, to a lead, a team lead, or something like that. And do the team leads have sufficient? understanding of this policy within the organisation to then refer to up the chain and go, hang on, this is probably something you need to do that. So I just wonder if it gets down to, to, to your level, which is clear with you and Sharon, and you've got a great relationship, but if it's a, if it's a comment that comes out in the workforce to, to one of the team leads in the Parks and Reserve, are they going to have the understanding of this policy to say this needs to go one step further? Just wonder if, we've, if, we, if we relate that down a level, Yes, absolutely. So, to, to, to allow it to come back up? So we've had an all-organisation launch of the policy Good subject time. to work risk, um, but we will be doing at a senior leadership level, so that's managers and team leads, right. um, training at that meeting. Thank you. And I think it is just on that, that point about asking the question, so are you wanting to make a protective disclosure? Is that what we are talking about here? Just getting people into the habit of at least checking. Oh well, no, I'm just having a mind. Yeah. Okay, well that's fine. Yeah. Move on. Okay. So does the same level of um, broadcasting of some of the nitty gritty go out to potential contractors who are who are seeing who are um, making applying to cons uh, not consents. Um, you know, if we let a contract and three people come into the room and say, yeah, I want a piece of that, is part of this part of their, part of their application? Oh, we're working with, I don't know, but previously contractors weren't included yeah. in this policy as they are now, so we will be making provisions to ensure that it's um, communicated out to them. Yeah, because I could see from their point of view, you know, they might feel really unsafe blowing the whistle on something because, you know, they might be the, um, what were the words that Chair had? Treated less favourably? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that could be dangerous signal if I, I was one of having a shot in the roading contract and I think, you know, but I've seen something bad, well, you know, am I going to blacklist myself forever? Mm. You know, that's, that's the risk here, so I think we have to have a very, very well communicated mechanism. And also, you know, the signal in there that you can't play the system by making complaints. I mean, and that's in there as well. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's it's the how we do it rather than as well as the, the legalistic stuff that follows it. So I think it's a valid question you raise, Angus, and how you spread the explain without in, ensuring that's sorry without imposing a week's training. Contractors <laughs> to induct them, I think, is a really interesting challenge. And some of the people who who, who apply to tender applications, one always had the sort of skill set that you know is in this room. They're good people at gardening or filling potholes on roads or whatever they do. That sort of competency is might not be part of their world. And so, you know, it's a big step for someone. 
Absolutely. Interesting challenges in this. We'll leave that challenge with Anna. Thank you for that. <laughs> Very welcome. <laughs> Anything else on protective disclosure? So can we receive, just noting the suggestions, we don't need to actually specify what those suggested changes were, we've got the caption. Um, so you're happy with recommendation two then, that it endorses subject to the subject. feedback received from yes. the committee? Yep. We just put the word received. Yeah, that's on. absolutely fine, thank you. The committee, you're happy with that recommendation two? Yeah. Happy to move, Angus. Thank Certainly. you. Dave, seconded. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. Right. Against? Carried. Internal audit program. Mr. Toombs. Thank you. I'd just like to make uh, two introductory comments, if I may. Um, first one relates to section 2.2 .2 of the paper, which is on page 27 of the agenda items. Um, and if I'm sure committee members will recall, we introduced this new formal program probably a year ago or so, as attached as Appendix 1. And what's become apparent, obvious, as going through this is that the, the program was a trifle optimistic, um, based on the resources we've got and um, yeah, this time. So um, what, what I'd like to do is to bring to the next committee meeting a, an amended or updated version of this, bearing in mind the experience as, as to our ability to deliver a program of this scale. Uh, and there, there's two things to consider here. One is actually delivering the, the reviews that we've, that we've kind of uh, suggested we try and achieve. And also, each of these reviews ends up in a, a report, obviously, with a whole bunch of actions that need to be implemented. And there's no point in doing the review if you don't have time to implement the actions. So it's, 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 it's in all thankfulness, it's just too optimistic, I think, to do this number of reviews based on the level of resources we've got. So if it's okay with the, the group, I'd like to um, revise this um, and take on any suggestions now as to what committee members may think should be in the audit program, so I can put them in my draft. Certainly, thank you. Um, I'm not surprised, mm -hmm. given the additional pressures that have been on yeah. local yeah. government over the last 18 months, two years. So that doesn't surprise me at, at all. Uh, no, I, I think it's not concerned. No, I, I think what will happen is the number of A, we've got a whole bunch of A's there, which are, as you can see from page, um, 30 of the uh, a formal external review. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that my revised version will have a lot of these A's becoming a B or a C. So they're, they're more, they're still happening, but not to the same level of formality, more, more internal reviews. So it's still important we do this stuff. So for example, the, the top line on page 29, known arising material risks. Uh, I think SLT, ELT can do that in conjunction with SLT and maybe this committee. And in fact, uh, on Wednesday this week, ELT are going through any strategic risks that aren't currently on our register. And it's an ongoing thing we do each month. ELT looks at the risks. So, so, so that's, that's what I'm proposing. Happy to take on any comments. I the only additional thought that I had was um, to try and provide some graduation in here, not just in terms of the way that it's been tackled, but what we see as an you're very welcome to bring your priorities. I think this committee should also say, here are the three or four areas that we would like to see identified as top priorities. Yeah. So don't get missed. They still might not happen mm -hmm. for 12 months or 24 months, but we've got it flagged to try and provide some level of focus on if there are conflicting demands, what gets done. So I'm not suggesting we work through that now. Um, we'd be quite happy for you, for you to come back with the revised program around time and also some indication of, we think these are the top three, four or five areas that under any circumstances we must address. Yeah. 
They're all important, but some of them are more important than others. And we can then, as a committee, make, well, sorry, we, I should say, the committee, whichever, however the com committee is comprised post-election, can make a decision as to the items that they think are priorities. I think, um, Chief Chair, if I may, the, the comment earlier from Mr Toons with regards to the ELT and like meeting on a monthly basis with known or rising risks, that in itself should determine the work priority out there because no one had a rising risk, the big word being a rising. So you may see something come up and go, hang on a minute. But that may move something from a C to an A pretty quickly, depending as it, as it comes. So that top line in itself will formulate um, your top four or five um, for, for review and the significance of that review based on, on that in itself. And if that's happening uh, through a senior management on a regular basis, and that should determine the outflow that you're requiring as to what the, what the priority is. So you see some of these, as you can look through, and you've got to really list them as, as, as C's and things like that, um, may be quite low in the pecking order as to the um, significance of risk uh, and, and the significance of being able to deliver our program going forward with, along with legislative requirements. So it should all start with that, that top line, I would have thought. And I, I guess, though, I was in using different words to try and say the same sort of thing in terms of the, the A, B and C is not a ranking in terms of importance, it's just how they are tackled and we need to put that layer of what's critical over it and BLT should be able to do exactly that. Andy. The only question I had around this was uh, I presume some of those categories, and you're right, it's not a ranking, but some of them may well be statutory requirements to have in place. And perhaps we should highlight those where there are statutory requirements. The next level down is the Ombudsman's Office send out a, a letter of in, virtually intent of things that they're going to scrutinise ahead of time. And it's usually a year out. So, for instance, if, if we know um, these things will be audited and carefully looked at within our internal audits, um, then there should be something that says, hey, an asterisk to say this will be looked at carefully. I agree. It doesn't necessarily move it from a C to an external review, it still could well be a C, but it is a C with an asterisk to say, um, must be done, this should be done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, don't, I think a good example of that too in a recent presentation by John Ryan, the Auditor General, was a very clear signal around climate change and the Audit Office focus on climate change. And it made, I thought, um, quite an interesting comment, quite valid comment, basically saying, if a council has declared a climate emergency, then our auditing of their activities in this area will ramp up. You can't make, a, a, in essence, you can't make a hollow statement. And I think that's, it was quite an interesting warning to councils that have gaily gone on and declared a climate emergency. They will have to have a significant program of work to support that statement. With the climate change one, we're a signatory to, first of all, um, the other councils and ourselves have combined to be signatories to a number of climate changes within the climate position. And then there are all the, the accords that government has signed up to as well, so there's a whole different levels of significance. Absolutely. Not saying I was looking through the list here, I didn't see climate change specifically on the internal audit program. I'm not suggesting it should be by any means. It's it's over to exec team to make a call on that. Okay, but you're right. I think that it is something that is probably a thing that the new council could at some stage look at and say. And I think I, I would 
I support that, Andy, when I think back to the workshop that was had with the current council around risk. It was one, a good level of engagement and genuine interest. And I think a similar workshop with relatively new with the new council, relatively early with the new council would be valuable. Well, yeah, and some of it's absolutely the scale against our budgets. Yeah. For instance, um, yeah, we have a number of multi-million dollar um, budgetary positions available in terms of you know, three waters, uh, our internal processes, um, the bioforestry, those sorts of things need to be identified and where they overlap. For instance, one of the categories is uh, contract and procurement, for example. And then those sorts of things must be of interest to, to council. Absolutely. Thank you. An Angus. Yeah, I found um, the on page 31, the appendix around ethics and elected members, I found that really interesting in terms of who is going to wade through that one. I mean, this, this, this sort of I would have thought would be part of a formalised training module. I mean, because a lot, you know, we elect people from the great unwashed outside this room, and suddenly we expect them to come up to a certain le level of ethical behaviour that they may never have, they might not even know how to spell ethic. Okay, and so I would see this as you know part of an incoming council's training procedure. But actually, we all have to be reminded of it every now and then, you know, just to brush up it on. I, I see that a bit of a minefield, but but actually a really laudable a, a really laudable goal. But crikey, it's going to be an interesting interesting task. I didn't think of that specific question when I was reading this through, but I was having similar thoughts about by oh, crikey, this would be interesting. Yeah. No. If I may say, when I introduced this paper, I did say there were two areas I wanted to look at. The first one was attachment one, which I think we've agreed that I'll bring a revised draft to the next meeting. Absolutely. And my second comment was around, I think, section 3.2.4 of my actual cover paper, page 28, which leads into what uh, Councillor Gordon was just referring to. Um, so the internal audit has come back with a suggested approach to um, the ethical, the, the internal review has been labelled ethical, and that was, yeah, to sit down and have interviews with selected elected members about process around how they uh, address three different council decisions and I thought rather than proceed with that I bring it to this committee to get some feedback exactly on what Council Gordon was raising is that the approach that the committee members think would be best pursued I, I, well Dave would be interested in <laughs> um, you just throw me in the throw me in the deep end first um, I like the concept um, and I and I think I think it has, um, I think it has a great deal of merit uh, for um, both parties, both elected members and and for um, council, as we all, you know, and council staff, as you know, I, I genuinely believe they all work together for this common goal, and I think this is quite a good approach. But I am a little surprised that the outer scope says decisions involving procurement. And I just wondered on on that one when you said the decision making process of you know three in the last twelve months. I was looking at that and I wanted to comment from you as to why the out of scope was decisions involving procurement when many of the things that we sign off with um, come back to us for reports from from council staff and good reports, detailed reports. And I'm I'm pleased with the the level of information that we get, but ethics and procurement to me link quite tightly together i'm surprised that that was out of scope so using your comments on that uh, yeah this wasn't our proposal this was this is what was put back to us as to how the, the internal auditor which is an external firm wanted to or was proposing to deliver this ethical review and to say oh we didn't we haven't moved forward with it we've had this for a couple of months because it doesn't want to get feedback exactly along these lines as to whether the committee members thought that was the scope and the process that they would think would be good. I back Dave up on that. I, I think that's that's a key one. I mean, you know, we can all declare our conflicts of interest, but down on uh, where is it? Interactions 
with other whereas interactions with other elected members. Yeah, page thirty one. Yeah, it's, it's down in the it's it's down in part of the detail there. You know, I might declare uh, an interest and I want to provide gravel to the um, the roading team, but then I lobby Andy and Dave, oh, yeah, I really need this contract. Well, that would be completely unethical. But I would have declared my interest and it would have influenced the rest of the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so I just said the procurement thing has got to be right in there. Well, it certainly is the area that the Serious Fraud Office indicates if there are issues. Yeah. Invariably, you find them more frequently in the procurement space than anywhere else. This is loot involved. Yeah. So that's different, but I mean, ethics. <clears throat> I'm going to come back and support your view, Angus, which is when you start to do something new like this, and when I say new, I mean, ethics have been around obviously for years, but in terms of putting a framework around it and measuring it, you know, if you're a regulatory agency, your first step is almost always to educate. First, educate don't start to penalise or measure mm, mm, mm. until you've had to put some effort into. Now, Andy, you might <coughs> say um, sufficient education has already gone on in this space. I don't know. It'd be interesting your thoughts on that. What I think happens when you get a new council formed is that staff and councillors, existing councillors say, we want this box, this box, this box dealt with. But if you're a brand new councillor coming in, um, I'm not going to refer to them as unwashed, but... Yeah, no, they don't know what they don't know. Uh, yeah, and that's what you in, intend by that word. And literally, there's so much stuff. It isn't until you're in the job two or three months that you actually start to be able to relate information that's being put in front of you to how you function as a councillor. I think there's always a danger that you immediately jump in and you, you run all these these workshops and for a lot of them, you know, it just goes straight over the top, you know. For instance, running workshops on depreciation, um, you're never going to really understand they're never really going to understand rating how that actually works until they've been in the chair for at least two or three meetings. So I think anything that you do in this space in terms of education to councillors, you need to think about their ability to be able to comprehend. Um, and and, the, and the, you just it's not just that too, but it's the amount of new information that you're putting on top of someone. It's, it's going to be more of a drip feed than you know, Dan Burst. Never before, they're going to be deluge of information, you know, three waters, RMA reform, or spatial positions, all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely, they're going to have to understand and know about very quickly. There's going to be far more information put in front of councillors um, and the mayor um, at the start of this training, mm -hmm. next training. Um, no. Absolutely. I mean, worst case scenario, you might have a completely, well, not a new council because you've got <coughs> uh, three councillors returned in different positions. But could be significant changes. Mm -hmm. No. To come back to my, my earlier comment, um, supportive of the of the program and, and, and like the initiative, and I think it's very good. I, perhaps referring to my comment of the outer scope, I would like to think that the outer scope isn't necessarily locked as outer scope on a full time, permanent basis. I, I'd, I'd like to think that maybe something that's outer scope could move into scope, at some stage, because there's there's some very very important stuff in that number one in the outer scope. And I think that perhaps the, the in scope, when you just rereading it again now and listening to uh, His Worship the Mayor's comments about intern, in, incoming um, council, they're all relevant. But some of those outer scopes, I think, might be worth to look at at some stage in the future. So I wouldn't want to see it locked out as being out of scope, might be my thinking. If something is brought to council, it is automatically within scope. So if it's a procurement thing that is brought to council, it's brought to council for a government's decision, therefore in scope, um, because you're required to make a decision. 
<coughs> so, you know, this question of what's in scope and out of scope, the reason, it, the reason it is brought to council is because it is in scope. Suggestion then, <coughs> and, I, and I take the point about the um, immediate workload on any new council and potential new councillors and equally balanced by the fact that this is a really important issue. The, whole, the concept of ethics, absolutely. Can I suggest that it remains as a live topic um, and in effect lies on the table, but it will be a decision between the organisation and um, the mayor and council as to when something might be initiated around maybe a workshop or something of that ilk around ethics. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a more practical suggestion, balancing workloads. Andy, your thoughts? Yeah, I think by necessity, a lot of it will be um, dealt with because of, we actually have to make a series of decisions. So there'll be, there'll be conversations ahead of a particular item that is on an agenda rather than full workshop, I think. And, and, and absolutely, you might get to a point where you <clears throat> collectively as a council have said, well, actually, it has been a subset in all of these decisions. People are now very comfortable and familiar with the frameworks around ethics. There's little point in having a workshop. I completely accept that that may be the scenario. Uh, I was just going to ask a question around the second one out of scope, decisions made in committee. Is that sitting there because the person who wrote the paper believes that decisions should not be made in committee, or it's because you know that is an unethical behaviour, or is it saying that what is discussed in the room and all of the processes that go through stay in the room and it's not ethical to drag it out of the room? Because I think that you know, if we, we make a number of decisions in committee and just picking up on Andy's comment about new, new councillors coming in, they may <coughs> never have been exposed to that environment and the sort of rules and behaviours that you expect. You know? So my first question is, you know, why is it there? Because that would be part of, if we were going to have a learning module for new people to come in, I would have thought that in committee decisions is a key part of it alongside ethics and other things like that. Can I just do some clarification here? We don't have a right to make a decision in committee. There is very, very little de designation to our standing committees to make a decision. So any in committee or workshop for that matter, there has to be a funneling back to council to make that decision. So I just hate somebody thinking or watching this live stream to think that their committees have a huge amount of autonomous power because they don't. Certainly, <coughs> make recommendations to council. Yeah, I usually probably, probably use the wrong word. I was I was thinking more um, when we have a public excluded session where we where we deal with sensitive information. That was really where my thinking yeah. was coming from. I had the wrong word there. It should have been public excluded, not in committee. But but it's the the same big picture think, if you like. Yeah. Well, so we have, well, rather than delving into the content, can we sort of go back to what I think our guidance to Dave is, is, is in essence, keep this as a live topic and raise it with council, maybe via audit and risk, um, for consideration. And that may, there may be a training session, a workshop, there may be some audit, but there's a number of possibilities or tools that could be used if if it's deemed appropriate to progress, put some time and effort into this as a topic. I think we're all flagging, we're interested in it. I think as Andy correctly points out, uh, it's going to, ethics will apply across all sorts of functional decisions that will need to be made in the early months of a new council. Yeah, and 
through you, Chair, if I may add, that, that will necessitate some urgency, I still believe, within that new council line to have a look at these key items, particularly the one you've got in scope. I think that is something that, whilst it's appropriate to let it lie as a discussion document and go through to the next uh, to the next incoming council, but there's a number of matters in there that you know new councillors in particular would need to be aware of what's, what's ethical in their behaviour. So can we suggest, because there is, <coughs> there will be again uh, an induction for new, new council, uh, and potentially a new mayor if it's an experienced mayor, but that would be, this content is considered as part of Absolutely. what is covered in that induction workshop. We've tended to focus the conversation on the ethics of, of councillors as to whether they have a right to contribute to conversations. However, this is going to be, uh, become a very difficult space over the next five to ten years. So the ethics will include things such as um, the environmental considerations. They will include such things as conversations around co-governorship positions. Yep. You know, all of these social horizons that are coming out now will become part of the ethical considerations of a decision. <coughs> and boy, it's going to get in a very tricky space. You know, at the moment, uh, the government has said, for example, with major expenditure, a percentage of that must go uh, to iwi with a lot of governmental type processes that will funnel down to local government. Um, I'll leave it there, but it's it's not going to be just about individual councils' um, perceived benefit. All right. Now, have we provided sufficient clarity? Muddy the water for me. I know, because I think. These are, these are the, I think, very valid conversations to occur <coughs> in that induction. Yeah, I, was, I was just checking the calendar to see if the next audit and risk had actually been scheduled yet. But it, um, it'll be December, January time, which will kind of, like, I think, be a good time to have this discussion again once we've got the new councils set up, identified. Well, the new council will have to establish that the audit and risk process as it is now will continue um, so there'll be a series of recommendations around yeah. that it should continue and presumably should continue with an independent chair yeah. and and to, uh, the adoption of terms of references you know? well, I wouldn't envisage the risk of speaking out of town which I'm not used to I wouldn't envisage that um, the new council would have any significant change to the current setup. I mean, it's considered best practice within the local government sector. And I, th I think all, in all likelihood that's right, but it's that's there's still their decision yeah. to make. Oh, for sure, yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess where I was going with this is the the, new, the most likely outcome will be we have a committee similar to this that will meet in December or January, and if and when th this would still be a, a, a subject for discussion at that meeting. It may be uh, through you, Chair, just in, without going down to, into what your role is, Dave, but there may be just a level to consider um, uh, our community committees somewhere along the line on this level as well. As a consideration, don't need to go into that now, but just a thought in the back of the mind is where does community committees sit with these, these sorts of uh, ethics? I think it probably tied back into what we do as council, so I think it's possibly something that might be, if it is going to be, for example, a workshop or something, or, or something that some community committee chairs should be involved, potentially as well. And or board, uh, you know, that we have, we have a couple of community boards, so it would be appropriate, I would think. I agree. That's good sense. All right. So let's look at our recommendations then. So it's um, internal order programs been received, and we accept the advice for the review of the work plan. Um, we have provided feedback um, on the proposed ethics review. Do we need to say anything further? Or you, it's, your, it's just if we refer to these minutes, have we captured that sufficiently in terms of 
items? Yes, you probably have. Yeah, so, I just refer back to the conversation I had, or the points I made earlier around identifying what are statutory requirements and identifying what were the things that the Office of the Ombudsman had said will be up for review. You know, and then there's an, another level down where the excellence review has indicated some things need to be looked at. So. <coughs> So could we change suggestion that the report be received um, and the work program reviewed, taking into account statutory requirements, OAG and So the work program is reviewed so I just yep. taking into account statutory requirements, comma OAG priorities and areas of focus, comma and that's probably better. Yeah, better. Okay. Second. All in favour? Right. Against. Carried. Um, recommendation two. That's recommendation one. Dealt with recommendation two to some extent. Yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. In that case, we can move on to health and safety, health, safety, and well-being. Okay. Um, I'll take the report as read. Just to note that the dashboards for June and July are attached to this report, um, and the August dashboard will be presented in the November meeting. Um, we had three events in June and three events in July. There were no WorkSafe notifiable accidents or incidents for June or July. Um, in regards to the health, safety and well-being due diligence plan, so the current plan is attached to this report for reference. Um, apart from the health, safety and well-being governance training for the incoming council, the current due diligence plan has been completed. Um, we've had two workers done sessions that were undertaken since the last update. So one was with the Parks and Reserves and Animal Control Activities and the other was for front of house customer experience. Um, health, safety and wellbeing work program highlights. Um, so we had our mental wellbeing by design workshops. Um, the requested summary from the last order of the risk meeting is attached. Any feedback, comments? One just me, you, um, through you, you indicated three uh, events since the last reporting period. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to find out where they were highlighted somewhere in here. Um, outcomes from that? Any actions required um, from those events? Just no actions required. They're in um, 3.1.2 and 3.1.3. Um, so all incidents and near misses have been investigated and addressed. There's no follow-up. Okay, thank you. And for August, we've had um, two incidents and three, three near misses, and they've all been investigated and actioned. I would like to just make a comment. I think the um, Stop Take 5 is a great initiative. It's um, quite a good concept that yeah. probably could, uh, could uh, 
if I, if I may pick that up in some other areas that I'm involved in, it's quite a good concept, that one. All right, any further questions or comments? I'll just comment that it, uh, and to say thank you for the invitation to sit in on the mental health and wellbeing workshop. Thank you, I enjoyed that. And it was valuable, I thought. And interested to hear what what sort of conversations flow from that, subsequent to that, around uh, the exec team or the leadership team? I can comment from the senior leadership team. Mm. So uh, it was very well, well received. Um, we've recently had our employee engagement portal survey, <coughs> and the results from that have shown that um, an uplift in almost 10% from last year in regards to um, line managers supporting staff wellbeing. So I think it's definitely made its mark and a priority for everyone who attended. And I think I think this organisation is lucky with its um, and leadership, and I mean that in the widest group sense, that these are topics that are of interest and genuinely valued. <laughs> convinced that it's seen the same way in lots of other organisations. <clears throat> Angus. Yes, I've got a big picture question. Our health, safety and wellbeing is very inwardly focused. Um, and I just wonder how we, as a council, extend that outside to our ratepayers and the people we serve in terms of their um, attitude or opinion of us. So if if I was, you know, ratepayer Joe, and I'm going to make a complaint because I think that we haven't been performing adequately. Um, it, you know, it's in it's in the region in the realm of reputational risk. So how do we actually flag that on a report back to elected members and or the ELT? Um, do we actually have? I'm, I'm sure we do somewhere a mechanism that that flags. Oh gosh, we've had you know five nasty complaints this month. Um, two of them were vicious. Um, the other three were actually relevant. One's really serious. Now you know I would have thought that, you know it's just taking the dashboard and it's really health and safety of our reputation and and how we perform with with the community that we actually are meant to be serving. How how do we flag that back? Because I think it might be relevant that. It, that sort of stuff comes to this committee rather than possibly full council. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I think there's more than one thing going on in that question, yeah. Councillor. I think the SSP is uh, a specific uh, tool that we use to see how we supply services to the community and allows them to request services or complaints. All of those are counted and, and reported back to council on a quarterly basis. So that's covered in that, this is specific to the health and safety of our staff mm. and well-being of our staff. So I think the two things are quite separate. Uh, risk to reputation is something that we will discuss, I think, in formats like this one. Mm. Uh, but it will be flagged through all those other tools that we have in place to be sure that we keep an eye on all the services that we provide. And if I could just make a further point, mm. um, that was one area that um, the council might report recommended that we actually look at was how to measure reputation, which we've never done as a council. So we're actually looking at what those options are for us at the moment and how other councils do it um, and getting some guidance on that about the best way to do it. So supplementary for a moment, would the SSP be reported quarterly in a, in a similar format to this or is that sort of detail well down the track at the moment? Well, the statement of serious points, you would have, sorry, three, you, you would have seen the end of year result came to council yep. last month. Um, and so we, we've made massive improvements to that. So it's a, it is a dashboard, but there's a lot of information that you need to provide with the measures beside it. So I think what where we've come to with the new format um, works well, and it seemed to be more understood by, by council um, 
because we've got the traffic light system as well and that, so that is really a major reporting mechanism to council. Yeah, yeah. If I may, Chair, you know, I think I think we we've, we've got an election coming up in a month. I think part of how that performs is going to be part of you know our reputation and the reputation of local government is going to be wound into how many people actually get involved. And if we get it really wrong here, that it actually affects how the whole mechanism of democracy and everything works. You know, people get so disenchanted they think stuff of bother. Um, but but it's you know it's it's how we report back to ourselves, how we then pick it up and make use of that information. I mean, you know, this health and safety dashboard is great. Um, and this information there. And if we want to ask more questions, we you know we ask the appropriate question and dig down into the detail. Mm. I'll, I'll just leave it there. It's just a high level <coughs> thought. Thank you. Mm. Well, in that case, if there's nothing further, we need to receive um, a health, safety, and wellbeing report. Move up for that. Thank you, Dave. Seconded, Angus. All in favour? Uh -huh. Against? Carried. Insurance update. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, so this report is a, um, a list of insurance claims lodged uh, the, during the financial year uh, as it was compiled in August. Happy to report there's been no claims so far this financial year. As we go through the year, uh, that may get things added to it. Any questions? Well, I'm happy to receive that. Mm -hmm. been no mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very, very keen to <laughs> second that, actually, <laughs> which I shall do. Um, all in favour of its receipt? Aye. Against carried. I might just make the observation that there is a few out there that's having no insurance claims. It's actually um, a waste of your premium fee, but I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> No, although the premium fees do continue to, mm. yeah, cause one to mm. squirm a little, absolutely. Sensitive expenditure? Yep, the uh, report that comes every six months, we just report what's in our ledger for the various areas of sensitive expenditure. Sam, our new financial accountant, done a good job at re presenting it in a more user-friendly format, I believe. So uh, happy to take any questions. It's really for noting. Um, I might not be able, I probably won't be able to answer any questions about the detail behind these figures, but it's for the committee to note. One quick question for me. Yeah, it's, I just note it says in uh, 3.12 has not been audited. So what's the what's the auditing behind that? When when does that get audited? Or well, our, our June accounts are all, I think our audit scheduled for to start October and finish in December. Uh, the audit won't go down to this level of making no this. so when it says it has not been audited has that been not audited internally or yeah yeah, yeah not been subject to any real review if uh, there's a high level look to see if anything doesn't look right mm. um but the figures are so small that the external yeah, it, it, yeah. it reads it reads fine but i just noted that it had not been audited no, so no. what that meant it, uh, it, it just means that the, the, there could be errors in there okay Welcome. I guess that's another thing that new councils often look at. Um, there's a fair list of catering, for instance, and just about every new council gets <coughs> from place. Um, that gets questioned. You know, um, Wellington Council saying, well, you need to bring your lunch and, and your paper bag, etc. Or leave. It is what it is. Yes. Um, yeah, and I think yeah, Hutt City had a stoush as well with some councillors, similar lines. Absolutely. I would like to think, Chair, that an incoming council would have greater concerns than what's sitting on the sort of paper. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts entirely. My apologies for that, but not at all. I would like to think so. I, I agree, but tens of millions of dollars worth of contracts and worrying over you know, <coughs> the flags. The fact that it is trending also under budget, yeah, I think is. Yeah, the conversation is always whether there should be a budget. Yeah. <laughs>
once made the observation or the comment, if I may, that a lot of the travel costs, like most councils in the country, are below budget. Um, obvious reasons. Consequence, yes, yeah. absolutely. I think that is probably sufficient discussion on sensitive expenditure. We need to receive this report. Thank you, Angus. Thank you, Dave. All in favour? Against right. carried. Treasury reporting. Thank you. And as the paper um, comments, I think the committee has asked for this report to come each quarter just so we can see how we're tracking compared to our benchmarks and Treasury management policy. And I think section 3.2 and 3.3 and 3.4 and 3.5 will show that our ratios were quite comfortable because I think we're all aware that our debt level limit at that amounts are well below where they can be and were predicted to be. Not necessarily a good thing because obviously that's in conjunction with our capital expenditure, our capital program. But um, it shows that uh, unlike some some other councils, at that position is quite comfortable. Thought that did occur to me, and it's a, a random thought, and feel free to reject this. But for the for three two and three three, they are so far below any criteria that. It's fine, we'll move on quickly. The other two, three, four, and three, five are getting closer. And I just wonder whether it is possible, easy, and useful to see some sort of trend analysis that actually says last 12 months is tracking in this direction rather than just an absolute figure. Andy. The ball goes, game's gonna change. You know, three waters come some. Our income drops. Uh, yes, we get loan money repaid to us. But there's going to be a whole game changer here. Um, and whether or not we will be in potentially in threat of some of these boundaries in the future, bearing in mind that we've got some very significant expenditure outlined in our LTP in terms of, for instance, new buildings and non three water stuff. That's, that's the concern. Absolutely. So, um, because the ground's changing, throw my comment out, Dave. Yeah, we are scheduled to have a workshop later on this month. On and this one of the things that we're looking at is three waters and exactly that stuff. Yeah. Thank you. I, I share um, uh, Andy's concerns on it as well because we set, <coughs> we made a, we made a conscious decision when we did our long term plan uh, to stick with the status quo because that's all we knew. And, and we couldn't make predictions based on something that was floating around out there that was that was unsure. Given the fact that we now have some something that's uh, starting to head towards the surety of what the stance may be, and and next year we move into uh, year three of our long-term plan, so that's a review position. We'll be in a much stronger position by the time we do that. But um, we need to really, and I acknowledge that there is a workshop coming on because it's a question I've asked in full council, we really do need to get a very early indication as to where this sits or where our these numbers look like without our three water assets on our on our books because it's um, going to significantly change these these numbers in this platform. I think there's a great deal of risk somewhere sitting in there. Absolutely. Yeah, we need to get a good understanding. Sure. I mean, I'll, 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 a high level review is if we get our three waters related debt paid to us that signalled in our audited documents, then that, that could be 30 million, that that should get rid of all of our existing debt. Uh, the issue is going to be we've got these stranded overheads like every council will have and how we we'll deal with them. Yeah, my, my, my thinking of the risk is where does it sit with regards to our borrowing capacity as a council outside of any three water activity uh, without those assets? backing us. You know, where, does, where does that sit? I'm just not sure where that sits at the moment and it's in a space that's probably more than yours and mine, but I would like to see that as part of, even perhaps if that's a question as part of your workshop, is what does that look like without without those assets on our books and what is our, what is our capacity potential? Andy? But we don't have surety as, as to government's position either. There is still so much that is unknown and I'll give you one potential example at a very, very high level. So, for instance, say you went back to a jam jar accounting for a wastewater plant 
and you can assign the debt to that wastewater plant that we're told is going to be repaid to us. However, that jam jar may also have a depreciation balance within it as well. So that's rate money that's put against that. There's been no absolute decision that I know of that the government has said, well, that depreciation reserve account won't actually be passed to the entity as well. So we're still, there's so many unknowns with this legislation that we don't have the surety of information to be able to put out to ourselves, let alone the community. Absolutely, Angus. Um, just my comment was I would have thought getting too worried about the numbers that are on the page there, it's almost relevant. The whole sector is going to be turned on its head in the space. And so these numbers, you know, what's an appropriate um, percentage number is going to get reviewed. I wouldn't get hung up about it now. Um, and I think there's going to be far people in far worse position, positions than us. Well, Auckland Council, the biggest council in the country, <coughs> has put out information to say they are concerned mm. um, because literally they're passing over their, their whole asset base yeah. to Entity A. Mm. So. Okay, incredibly so, complex <coughs> position. Absolutely. Um, but on this basis, with this, we do it with we, we are, yes, we're speculating. Um, so let we, we just need to uh, receive this report. Happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. All right. Annual report update. All looks to be under control. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This is provided just for the committee's information so you can see, so you're aware of what's happening with our year end process. And as you say, we're no cause for concern. Comments, questions, receive report. I was just wondering if it was appropriate. Um, Councillor Belshin received this report so he can get his name on the on the on the field. <laughs> Prove that he's here. He is here. I was actually going to ask a question to, to get my name on the board. But, but, uh, yes. no, I'm, happy, I'm happy to receive the report. Uh, please, <coughs> fire ahead with your question. Um, I mean, the, the report's fairly self explanatory and, and, and short, but uh, have you found any hiccups? Um, heading through towards the end of this process of getting the annual report finalised to date that we should be aware of? No, um, so I think the, the main main question might, might be around the timing of the audit. We're hearing that the um, audit office is highly stretched and a few audits have already been bumped elsewhere. So as as may, well, I've, not, I've got nothing concrete to suggest that as will we, but I wouldn't be surprised if the timing slid. Uh, interesting with that comment uh, that happened I think at the last annual report and process as well uh, with the pressure they were under so nothing's changed in that respect no no but in internally our, our processes and controls uh, leading us to be satisfied with where we are and getting the draft reports ready thank you just on that too interesting to note as of Friday <coughs> but plenty um, small CCO, we've just received a letter from OAG saying BDO will be your new auditor. Mm. So uh, quite clearly they are <clears throat> looking for where they can pass off work. Now that's a, that's a very small cheese, I have to say it's a small entity, but it did, I, if they're doing that there, I'm sure they're scrutinising any number of their core audits and trying to work out where capacity exists elsewhere. However, I don't think that will relieve the problem, even in the short term, because you read through the letter and talk about the handover, which will have both parties working together on the first order. So I, sadly, in the short run, it's going to compound the problem, I, think, I suspect. But yeah, it's, good, it's good to see that they are at least addressing the stretch capacity to some extent. Anything further on annual report? Progress update? 
Oh, in that case, Nigel's moving. Yeah, it's the, uh, the report. Thank you. Seconded. Angus, all in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Fraud report. Thank you. If I may speak to paper, mm -hmm. yes. Um, again, a standing paper, uh, so we don't lose sight of these things. It's important, I think, to realise that uh, Section 3.1, and I think it follows on from a comment, a few comments that were made earlier about policies, that it's all well and good having policies, but if staff are unaware of them, they, they can lose their impact. So uh, this, this is one of the many things that we send out regular updates to staff, so they are aware that for we do the same as sensitive expenditure and gifts. So staff are constantly reminded of the fact to, um, whether these policies exist and what, what's, what their key elements are. And we are uh, offer to go around and discuss these things at staff staff meetings. But yeah, um, the, the key thing is no fraud's been uh, identified or alleged. Questions on the report? No. Well, just a comment. So going back to, I wasn't here earlier in the in the meeting, but the um, protected disclosures um, piece of uh, a report here. Does that make it with the change? Does that make it easier for people, or sort of less less onerous for people to perhaps disclose anything if they see any fraud type instances happening? The protected disclosures really um, come out of the um, people in the performance office. Mm. But no, I, I see it running in parallel with, with this. Uh, constantly just like educating staff that this is what you do if you, something doesn't, the, the, the old sniff test. If it's if it's, if it's it sniffs bad, you're encouraged to report it as opposed yeah. to do your own investigative work. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I think it does make it easier <coughs> at the process level. I'm not convinced it shifts people's emotional barrier to actually, you know, the, the problem of dobbing someone in continues to be an issue, I think, in a lot of people's minds is a barrier to making that type of disclosure. At least that's where my comment was coming from, so that someone, if, if they're concerned about it, uh, you know, is it easier for them to actually go and have a conversation with someone higher up uh, without, without perhaps getting identified? Um, I guess that's the, yeah, that's well, the thing. So you, Mr <coughs> Chair, I, I completely agree. So if we have a uh, protective disclosures policy in place that makes it easy for staff, it's important for us to remind staff that it exists mm. and this is the process of how it works so they feel safe in that space that yeah. if they do see something that doesn't, that doesn't feel right, that they, that they feel there's an easy way for them to just go and report it. So it's just something for us. Yeah. Like Dave just said, is to remind staff that these things mm. exist and these are the steps to take. Yes, so they, they don't feel jeopardised. Yeah. You know, they're not going to jeopardise their position um, yeah. by at least even raising it. You know, it may come to nothing, but as long as they feel that they're not jeopardised by, by raising it, I think, I think that's important. Absolutely, and I think just the process of review and refresh, and therefore the, the uh, promulgation of that among staff. Mm assists in that regard and we have heard about the activities that are underway in terms of ensuring staff appreciate um, and understand the policy is there and what it does and how it works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On that basis, can we receive the fraud report? Reporting, I should say. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dave. All in favour? Against? Carried. Strategic risk review. And we note the, the changes that have been made. I will just, again, if I can talk to the, talk to the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see in section 2.4 on page 49 that we have the, uh, the 10 strategic risks that are currently identified. And as you're all aware, ELT reviewed two of these on a rotational basis through each year. Uh, this week, or at our next daily ELT meeting, we're looking at a, a bigger, I guess, uh, not just going through two of these, we're looking at the whole list to see if anything should be on there that isn't, and vice versa. And we're also looking at the, the format of the strategic risk register, just to add a bit more detail around that. So it might look slightly different next time. But just more, more information. Otherwise, happy to take any questions on 
or comments on the, the proposed amendments? The changes suggested, which are easily identifiable via track changes, all seem to be straightforward and sensible from my perspective. Angus? So we identify these strategic risks and when they all start lining up in a row and landing on our doorstep, what then? Because if you look at that list, we've probably got 2.4.2.3 and 0.7 on our doorstep right now you know capability political environment and climate change i mean they're all landing simultaneously i'm glad we don't live in nelson for instance you know um because the wheels are falling off for those poor people but that can happen to anybody so what then we just say well we're going to park a whole hunk of, hunk of our capital program because it's just not going to happen and get over it Andy, 2.4.10, that government changes that. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Transformational, Absolutely. that's the space we're in. Yeah. yeah. And we know, we know that that is likely to happen. There may be the best part of 83,000 submissions to say that Three Waters isn't going to proceed, but the reality mm. is that's where we're at. If I may yes. speak a comment on that question, uh, in the register we identify the risk, what the risk is, uh, the likelihood that it could happen, but then on the other side we have mitigating actions yeah. to reduce that risk and that really is our best tool at this, at yeah. this point. Uh, as to how do we prepare and what do we do when it hits? And if I may just continue that, yes. uh, one of the, uh, I mentioned earlier we're adding more details to the strategic risk register. Uh, this hasn't been discussed to the nth degree with my colleagues yet, but one of the things we're looking at is, as you can see, the strategic risk register has got um, uh, inherent risk and treated risk. We're going to have, have an extra session as to future future mitigation actions as well. So we're just emphasising that the right-hand column isn't the end of the line. It can be, in some cases, a work in progress, and this is what we're doing next. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a future mitigated risk. So we've got current mitigated risk and future mitigated risk, just so we can see what we need to do to continually address these issues. Thank you. Okay, just, just in the past, we've seen this in the format of uh, uh, you know, assumptions being high, low, medium uh, for others. What is the... Um, you know, these, these things will, will shift. There's no doubt that they'll shift and something will crop up and you'll, you'll look at it and go, hang on a minute, this is, this is going to flag as a flag. As a, what is the reporting mechanism? Is that changing within? What, what's your reporting mechanism back to, to governors to say, we've flagged a risk here and we've, we've got an answer for it or we've got a program work. What's that? How does that flow? So you're asking like in between these meetings, yes. if and if a likelihood or an impact of one of these risks changes, yeah, e ELT will under the under the new risk management strategy, ELT have a constant review of all strategic risks. So m maybe not formally, but it's something we'll, that we'll be reviewing or identifying on a weekly, straight, monthly basis when there's a change to any of these. And if it needs action, then obviously the, the action will follow. That is part of the, the new risk management strategy that's been rolled out. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, if, uh, just, uh, it's a, I think it's a really good question, and, and maybe we should consider to add something, let's say, to the Finance and Performance Committee or some way, some f easy format that we can bring that to council or an arm of council to say, is a red flag over here. It's something that we don't do that's not structured at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, think, in that discussion, maybe. I think that's what I'm referring to. Where does it, where does it become that there's been a shift? Mm. Yeah, because the shift, uh, sorry, Chair, but the shift may be significant enough to have mm. yeah. Yeah, a large flow on effect. Yeah. And, and what, 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 is the, what is the point that that gets flagged and goes, hang on, we, we thought this was low, and we've treated, as it, treated it as low for a number of years and suddenly it becomes higher with a major big red flag in it and, and the consequences shift a whole lot of other stuff as well. So, so absolutely. So rather than trying to solve it now, mm -hmm. what I think we're asking, and I support that, is that there is there's um, an escalation path and a trigger. Yeah. That says yeah. that if yeah. here's the criteria, if it meets this criteria, here's the escalation process. It's flagged.
So the recommendation becomes the strategic risk review is received um, and feedback noted. Yeah. Yeah. Sufficient. Are we happy with um, that as a recommendation, in which case it mover. Thank you, Dave. <coughs> Second, yeah. thank you, Nigel. Second. All in favour? Oh. Against? Carried. Audit New Zealand management letter update, <coughs> noting, of course, the reminder <laughs> to the committee. Second 2.2, yes. Yes, indeed. So I'll, again, if I may talk to it, uh, so Sam's done a great job in updating and simplifying this report to make it easier to read, I think, and to see uh, that these number of items that are still outstanding is significantly reduced and the report should be easier to address. And, yeah. So they are, at the, with, with Sam being on board now, he's doing a great job of proactively constantly reminding people that we need to address these items. Right. Yes, my questions are around, so your, your level of comfort with progress uh, and what do you think Audit New Zealand's level of comfort would be with progress? I think when they see the maturity of where we are now compared to, say, 12, 18 months ago, they'll be very pleased that they can see we're taking this seriously and it's structured and it's formalised, as opposed to before it's been a bit more ad hoc. Other questions? Andy. Um, this, we're dealing with pages 54 and 55, as I see it. Um, the first point I'd make is the top one, 1920, eight, near 1920, it was raised, uh, identification of earthquake prone buildings, and it refers to 17 council-owned buildings, but we have a legal requirement to identify all earthquake-prone buildings um, to, to go on to MB's lists, um, and we're in danger of not being able to complete that within the statutory time frame. And I totally, totally accept the constraints on staff timing, etc. Um, but the downstream repercussions of actually not identifying it could be significant for a privately owned building so they can go back and say well we weren't told and it wasn't on the list at this date so that one's important <coughs> to me the, the one at the bottom of the page um classification of capital expenditure um Think, I'd just like to thank staff for the work that is being done in that space between OPEX and CAPEX because the ability to capitalise the capital programme and therefore be repaid if the entities come into place is huge. So I'd just like to thank staff there. The other one of significance to me is halfway through the next page 55, is it? Um, and it talks about. Um, the review of pro procurement um, practice, etc. Just like to sort of note that the most, signi most significant um, contract that we have is the contract for shared services. And that has been, that's something that we actually need to actively continue to keep in, in our mind space here. No good just saying that we're going to get man or two to review our contract positions when they are essentially a contract in themselves and a very large one. Mm. Yeah, can yeah. I make a comment Sorry, before Carol, you yes. go to Fee? Just on the earthquake prone buildings, I know this has been raised before, and there is a detailed council report coming to explain all this at the end of the month. So I just wanted to make that clear that we aren't ignoring it. Um, but Fee's got a question on that. Just, just if I may, please, just on that, do you have any sense of where is it sitting in terms of progress, as it says, identification of you know, all council-owned 
buildings need to be assessed? Like what percentage have been um, completed? So out of the out of the 17, 12 have had detailed seismic assessments, and the reports actually sit on our website. Um, five have been identified as potential earthquake prone. A couple of them have been sold, and the other three, when they did the investigation, were not deemed to be earthquake prone. So the ones that needed to be completed from my understanding had been done, and that'll all come out in the council paper at the end of the month. Yeah. yeah. So is that all count? Sorry, and the all all of council-owned buildings have been assessed or the included. The ones that were that identified as potentially earthquake okay. prone. Andy. I don't know whether you want to take Councillor Dalgetty's question before mine. Uh, she had her hand up first. So. She does. Thank you. Fee, my apologies. I needed to be reminded that you had your hand up. So I <laughs> apologise for ignoring you. I wasn't. Uh, no, no problem. Um, I just was wondering around um, items two and three on that list. Um, it's labelled as in progress. But do we have a sense of how far through that is or where they're actually at currently, please? This is assets and infrastructure assets. So that's, <laughs> yes, assets with no construction date and condition and performance data for infrastructure assets. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know, I can, yes, I can remind you that. So the first one is uh, with specific attention on the roading assets. Uh, that's an ongoing process that we have improved on substantially over the last two and a half years or so. So we went from uh, a rating of, I can't remember the exact numbers, but call it in the 68 kind of the same numbers to up to in the 90s. Uh, and we're one of the best performers in the country. So that is progressing well. The next one with the condition and performance assessment, those are progressing really well. So we have a three year roadmap that we passed on to audit uh, and we're sticking to those timelines. Obviously the, the three waters reform complicates things a little, uh, but we're going to continue with the work. It's, uh, it's really necessary and will have big value regardless. So the so short summary of that. Thank you. Right, thank you. Anything further, Fee, on those no. or others? Thank you. Andy. I'll go back to the earthquake, and, and I accept that we're going to have an extensive workshop on this, and it isn't timely. But, um, you know, even with our 17 buildings that we own, we've had an earthquake report. So then the council has to reach a decision whether we're going to challenge our own report. And if we don't, if we make the decision that we're not going to challenge that they are deemed earthquake prone, then they should be forwarded immediately to the MB list. We've got no, no buildings that I'm aware of that are currently on the MB <coughs> list. So we're lagging the chain here. But that's with our own buildings. With the requirement to list the privately owned buildings. So we've gone out and, and identified a number of them. We are presumably waiting on a response from the privately owned buildings as to whether they're going to challenge that or not, or a year plays out and then they should go on the list. But if there is a requirement that we have to have them identified by, say, the end of 2022, and I can't remember the dates offhand, and we don't do so, then somebody could purchase those buildings, look up the list, they're not on there, there was a requirement for them to be on there by a certain date and then assume they're not earthquake prone on that basis. So at the potential for council's position to be awkward could be quite high. So I just welcome the workshop that's coming because I think we do need to tidy it up. I think it's best to wait till that paper comes out because Johan is our expert. Yeah. I'm just going on what I had to apply to our media first on, so I think it's best to wait for that. I agree. Uh, and I think in this discussion, the important thing that his wish is bringing up really is there is a risk. I think that's a valid comment. There definitely is a risk. But I think we don't have the other side of the discussion in the room today and we'll be in the room on the on the workshop and then we will have a good good look at it in detail. We 
soon as the when is the workshop? Well, it's not, it's actually a council report. Oh, right. Going go. to the end of the month council meeting. Right. Yeah. Could I just further okay. to that question, if I may? That's a council report on council owned buildings? No, it's an explanation on the earthquake prone buildings. Yes. It's, it's been generated from discussions from that um, the meeting that was held at Tamatapihi yeah. and a few other queries that we've had. And there's a bit of a um, we're trying to get some clarity, so it's all written down. Johan's in the room, and we can explain what the process is for all buildings to get put onto uh, the so end list, sure as that, well as councils. Thank you. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify that was all buildings, because it is my understanding, as the worship, uh, as worship has indicated, it is council's responsibility to do that first initial, is it or isn't it? But we base it on our information to say the information we have suggests that it may be, it's then up to the individual owner to say whether it is or isn't. That's the question that's being asked effectively in the community. So Johan will be able to answer that as part of that paper. All right, anything, any additional items on the Audit New Zealand Management letter update? Oh, in that case, oh, sorry, Angus. Uh, um, his Worship brought it up earlier, and I just wanted to clarify, it's with respect to shared services, does that sit under the contract management box, or is that sitting under the monitoring of contractor performance area, or, the, or neither? I mean, it was a really good question, and it's something that's, I actually had it circled under monitoring contractor performance, but do we actually in our heart of hearts, actually believe that shared service is actually an external contractor? Is it a lovely sort of collegial arrangement? Question mark. I'm just leaving it out there. You know, we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, if, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think we definitely view them as a service provider, as a contractor, there's no doubt. Uh, I think what makes it a bit more complex is the form of the relationship uh, is vague uh, and kind of evolved over time. It, where if you think of a service contract, the normal service contract will be very specific on many things. Uh, this is not, so it's just that relationship, it's a bit vague. But definitely a service provider, a contractor. Okay. If I may comment, I mean, you know, I think one thing we have to consider is the political complications, that's how I describe them, of, of, of that, because if, if the wheels start to fall off, then there's another, there's another angle on it, if you like that may not, you know, it's, it's easy to keep a, an, an external contractor at arm's length, but when the external contractor is also our neighbour and we want them in the room or other, for other things, it makes that relationship a little bit difficult and really, you know, means that relationship is a bit conflicted. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it anyway. And I, th I think just based on the comments about the scale, it also, as I uh, said, as the, the ground's moved, mm and there are some elements that are um, not entirely clear. My suggestion is that uh, for any new um, audit and risk committee or whatever that happens to be, that that would be on their early, on their work program to have a look at. Mm. The shared services contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I may, of course. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's in for a challenging time uh, with the three waters around the corner. That's a large portion of it. <coughs> and uh, yeah, it, there would be some decisions around what that looks like in the future. That's a really important point, given the changing nature of the landscape. Mm -hmm. I'm just climate driven, no. <laughs> but uh, politically driven. Um, it's probably timely to have a look at that to say, is it fit for purpose? Is it appropriate? Thank you. Is, that, um, is the committee comfortable with that suggestion? All right, on that basis, um, if we change the recommendation that Audit New Zealand Management letter update be received, and a review of the shared services <coughs> contract be recommended. 
to the incoming Audit and Risk Committee. Sorry, Andy. Yeah. I'm not sure that recommended it implies almost that they no, have it significant mm. concerns. Mm. But more a noting that they are a, a major contract in themselves. Is that I'm just looking at how the words would be interpreted. Yes. Yeah, yeah, to some extent. Yep. Uh, I just wonder if we could just put that on the action list rather yep. than in a recommendation yep. then. Yep. Yes. If you're yep. with that. Yep. yep. So take that out and just have it as an action. Yep. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Very good. On that basis, do we have a mover, please? Thank you. Angus? Nigel? Are you happy to second? Thank you. All in favour? No. Against? Carried. Summary of management accounts. Thank you. Um, other committee members will be familiar with this. This is a summary of what was presented to the last Finance and Performance Committee. It's just an overview of where we are in the management accounts. Uh, we've already mentioned that the capital expenditure, uh, the level there, I think it's the most we've ever had. On page 57, there's a reference to operating expenditure. And apart from the three bullet points there, I think it's, it's encouraging to realise and acknowledge that the rest of our OPEX is pretty much at a high level on budget. A lot of councils, they get their op OPEX running away from them. And we don't have such issues, which is excellent. Uh, and the rest of it, I'm just yeah, happy to take questions. Comment that I thought that that style of summary and found it very useful. Great, thank you. So, questions? Andy. Yes. So, the annual report can't be finished until these decisions are made. In terms of carryovers, for instance, um, where it says on page 56 that the report is expected also include a reduction of some capital carry forwards so do all of those things need finalization before the annual report can be no no the annual report is going to report on what actually happened and a flow and effect of that will be some carry forwards will be changed because the some carry forwards would have been made on the basis that a level of expenditure will be here and finally the figures higher so the, the carry forward needs to come down. Yeah, so it, so then results in um, some sort of a additional line in the annual report? No, it, the, it, no, it won't be the annual report. Mm -hmm. it, it'll, the, the annual report is just going to reflect what the actual expenditures were. And if, if they impact upon a budgetary carry forward into this financial year, then it'll be noted in a report to Finance and Performance Committee the, the carry forwards won't be part of the annual report. I was thinking of the annual report from last year's financial report. Not this the annual plan. Yeah. Maybe this. Oh, I'll come and clarify it. Yeah. 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 Committee members and Fee, if you have any questions, anything further? I'm sure that finance is gone through this in detail. Yes, Neil, they have. Not, I'll just provide comment that, that this covers off the high level stuff out of that finance performance report, so um, which is applicable to this committee. So I think it's, I back up your comments, Chair, that the information here is, is valuable for this committee. Mm. Yep. <coughs> and, and easily digested, mm. as I noticed. Very good. Thank you. So if there are no, no further questions, Andy. Further from that, we need to Happy to receive it. Receive it. Thank you, Nigel. Seconded, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. All in favour? No. Against? Carried. Um, and we still can't let you off the hook, Mr. Toomey. <laughs> what um, risk committee work program? High, it's the high level work program. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and again, this is just um, a standard report we bring each each meeting, so you can see what the uh, proposed standard with, um, with reportings will be. If anyone would like anything changed, 
having gone through the meeting, you may decide that there's stuff in there you don't want to see each meeting or there's other stuff you do want to see. So really just to put it on the table. Again, I, my thinking would be that this is appropriately presented to any newly constituted audit and risk committee if there is one rather than us. Um, unless there's something standing out here that members of the committee do wish to change, don't. I would agree with that, with that comment, Chair, but also just noting that this was a structure that was put in place with this audit and committee um, uh, Audit and Risk Committee very recently, and I'm, I'm thinking it was within this within this year um, as a as a structure for a reporting thing. And at the time, we went through in some detail to do, to discuss what would sit on. It wasn't in this year, but it was certainly in a in a fairly recent. Yes. Point. So I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't see any need to change anything that's on there. As a would my would be my opinion. I agree. Oh, there was nothing that leapt out as being inappropriate or alternatively missing. Angus is thinking. Anything? Uh, no. So on that basis, are we happy to receive Audit and Risk Committee Work Programme? And again, maybe on the action mm. list. Yeah, yeah, Note yeah. uh, for the incoming, if they're assuming there is an Audit and Risk Committee. On that basis, a mover and seconder, Dave. Moving. Thank you, Angus. All in favour? Against? Carried. Now, I'm conscious of standing orders. Yes, you need to take a break. Yeah, I'm supposed to. But I wonder if you just want to go into public exclusion and take a break. Yep, thank you. I think that's. Um, so, on a basis, we have in front of us the uh, movement to. Sorry, the recommendation to move into excluding public excluded the reasons identified. Mover and seconder. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Thank you Nigel. All in favour? Right. Against? Carried. So we have moved into. Yes. So we'll just um, wait for the live streaming to 